So thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you've just heard my friend and colleague, Dr. Petros Grievous, present a compelling and elegant argument for neoadjuvant immunotherapy. However, to quote the great American statesman, Lee Corso, not so fast, Dr. Grievous. Um, those of you who don't know Dr. Grievous, I suspect that he started out with about 67 slides, cut it down to about 50 and delivered it about 40 in 10 minutes using his considerable skills in rapid communication. I only have seven slides for you. So let me just sort of get started. There are a lot of examples uh, in oncology of I already know the answer. Here's a couple of them. Back in the um, late 80s, early 90s, high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue and, and advanced breast cancer basically was uh, all the rage. It stormed through the insurance process and the insurance companies were just overwhelmed with support by patients, support groups, et cetera. And they started paying for it right and left. And thousands of women underwent high dose chemotherapy prior to the completion of randomized studies, because of course we already knew that this was better. We knew the answer. And of course, as um, history shows, those trials not only failed to demonstrate improvement, but there was probably a decrement in survival. Uh, closer to home in our GU cancer space, we all know that neoadjuvant hormonal therapy prior to prostatectomy was certainly going to be the answer until it wasn't. So let's look at the data. Um, this is not phase two data, but this is randomized trials. Remember where this started from. This is uh, a comparative trial back in the day, published now more than 15 years ago, comparing MVAC versus GEMSYS in metastatic urethelial cancer. Small trial, as was the want in those days. But in red, what's highlighted is that cisplatin-based chemotherapy cures a small subset of patients. Those are probably patients with primary nodal metastases, occasionally some other soft tissue sites. And the numbers aren't great, but they're real. So this is the sort of the underpinning of the role of neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. These are the two trials that get referred to a lot, although the first trial, the trial that was done primarily in Europe, uh, which was a complicated trial in that it had three arms, this trial basically was done first and reported out, and with long-term follow-up, demonstrated that cisplatin neoadjuvant chemotherapy improved survival. It decreased the death rate by 16%. And that's compelling long-term data. It's not likely to change. The US intergroup trial, known as the SWOG trial, as we all know, demonstrated a survival benefit as, as demonstrated here. So these are the two trials. Now, we've spent many years talking about cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the low adoption rate, et cetera. And those are all relevant issues but that's not the issue in terms of replacing it with other therapeutic approaches. I'm gonna show you the meta-analysis. Um, again, 11 trials, 3000 plus patients. And I think the take home message here is that when you take additional studies, which are more or less well done than the two trials that we just referred to, there remains a real improvement in survival, albeit limited and no question that we need to do better. However, when we start with this data, this is the data that has to be taken into consideration as we wanna bring online new therapies. Just stepping back for a second and looking at the weight of the evidence. Neoadjuvant IO-based therapy is based on some very interesting work, primarily phase one and two trials. Some of them are very provocative with regards to P0 rates. And as we know, P0 rates may translate into, into long-term outcome. Although even that has to be demonstrated uh, in randomized trials. Neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy with its, all of its warts and challenges, et cetera, has compelling evidence, albeit of minimal, but real survival. So I would argue that until such time that we have similar compelling evidence from randomized trials, and as you all know, some of these trials are actively ongoing and need to be accrued to, while cis-ineligible patients certainly represent patients who should be studied given the fact that we cannot administer cisplatin in this setting, I think that we still need to maintain a certain degree of caution when we enroll cisplatin eligible patients in whom a subset, albeit a small one, may be offered curative intent therapy with cisplatin before we accede to 
we know that IO-based therapy is clearly going to be optimal. So with that, I will leave you with another quote from a, a very famous urologist. When the results are good, we tend to say, that's a good treatment. And when treatment fails, we shake our head and say, that's a bad cancer. Thank you very much.